It's a good thing I have the other recording. Um, so this, like I was just saying, it shows you all the aggregates all together. Um, it makes no difference that they're all running at the same time. They're also kind of useless because they're not really related to anything. It's just a bunch of numbers. So what you want to do is normally you want to relate it to something. How many people in here have actually run a survey and collated the results? One. It's the same number as the last group. One. Not a very good sample size. Um, for anybody who's ever actually had to run a survey, especially back in the day, it really, really sucked. Uh, because you have to have numbers based on the questions that were asked. So if let's say it's a range uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you hate your life? And then you need to know how many people said 10 because they really hate their life. You have to say how many people had 1 because they kind of like their life. And then you got to say, you know, how many people had they're the normal ones. And then all the ones in between, and you have to collate how many, what the average was, all that kind of stuff. When you had to do it all by hand, it was terrible because you literally have to tabulate all the results. So what we normally do in this is we would add a column. So in this case, I'll just add the country ID. And I will now cause an error message. Because it's important you guys see error messages. It says column airport country ID must appear in the group by clause. So going back to my little story about collating the survey results, you're collating the results grouped by question and sometimes also grouped by the answer of the question. So when you um, add a column here, you have to tell it to group by whatever the display column would be. So in this case, I added country ID as my display column you have to include it in the group by. So if I do this, I now have these kinds of numbers. So I have the number of airports per country. I know the total elevation. Again, that's a totally useless number, but I the total elevation for that country. I happen to know what the average elevation is, what the lowest and what the highest airport is at for each country. It's useful stats. These are actual stats that you can work with. They're usable. Why do you have to include the display? Uh, or should I say, why do you have to group it by this display? Because the database server is not going to know how you want to break it down. You're saying, hey, display this column. But you don't know. It doesn't know how to break it down. You're telling it to display something, but you don't tell it what to do with it. Um, which is fine. Every database server will force you to include the group by, except for MySQL. MySQL looks at your query, goes YOLO. You're asking for the country ID, have the first one in the database, whatever it is. And we're going to put all the numbers tied to that. It doesn't actually do any grouping. It just picks a random value for those columns that aren't grouped, which is very misleading. So that's one of the big downfalls of MySQL is you can write really bad queries that look like they work. Um, all right, so that's grouping. What's cool is, of course, you guys have seen order by ID. So you guys have seen ordering. And it's not ID. It is country ID. So I don't want to add more columns in here than I have to. Here's a country ID sorted here. But what's really nifty is we can actually sort by the aggregate. So this one is sorting alpha ascending. Let's let's change that to descending. And now we know that country 212 has the highest airport, which happens to be China. How do I know? I looked it up in the last class. Uh, I was betting on Nepal, uh, but apparently it's China. Uh, so I'm guessing probably 143 is probably Nepal. <laughs> Maybe two thirty one of these top ones here. Okay, so you can sort by the aggregate, so you can control the order. You can sort by multiple of these if we wanted to. 
Um, we can sort by the elevation and then by the count. Uh, actually, let's go sort by the count. Because then we will have, let's go ascending. Okay, because we've got a bunch of countries that only have one airport. And in theory, we could then go sort by the maximum elevation. So you can sort by multiple aggregates. And we can change that also. So there's all kinds of things you can do with the aggregates to make your numbers mean something. There is two things that I'm going to address right now. There's two things you cannot do with aggregates. Item number one. Actually, let me just switch out really quick to air, air, aircraft. Aircrafts. And I'm going to go uh, name, comma, count of description, comma, count of the week. And I'm going to get rid of the, uh, I'm just going to group by name. Okay. Oops. Uh, wake size. Because there's a few things I want to address before I talk about the things you can't do. You'll notice right now the numbers are identical. Because what's happening is it's counting the descriptions first and then it's counting the wake sized for each of those. Because it found three aircrafts for Tupolev, that means it found three wake sizes. If we were to throw in the distinct wake size, suddenly our numbers would change. Um, and if I were to add in the order by, I should have put the order by name on here already so that it stopped moving around. Um, let me take the distinct off really quick so you can see. See, Airbus has 36, but if I ask for the distinct wake sizes, oops, don't highlight that. I get two because Airbus only makes two sizes of planes, medium and large. Because the wake sizes, by the way, if you look in the database, the wake size have S. ML, small, medium, large. That's the, the amount of air of space that the airplane displaces. So the airplane goes this way and there's a turbulence behind the plane. That's the size of the wake. So different sizes of airplanes will have a different wake. So Airbus has only two sizes. Um, Antonov has three. They have 10 planes with three different sizes of wake. Um, so the, you can see how the distinct is changing the results into something actually meet that's actually meaningful. Um, I could go dis count distinct description. I don't think that'll make a difference. Distinct. Not distinct. Distinct. I'm having some major typing problems today. Uh, yeah, it makes no difference because each of the planes are unique to the, to the manufacturer. All right. So here's some things we can't do. Uh, let me give this an alias so it has a nice name to work with as uh, aircraft count as wake size count. So now we got useful column names. I can't go where. Um, Found a description greater than five. So I want to know only the air, aircraft manufacturers that have at least five aircraft. Right? It's a valid question. And if I try to do that, it's going to say aggregate functions are not allowed in where. Probably the most useful error message you'll ever. That's. You're not. Usually people at this point will ask me, well, why can't you? It's because of the order of how it gets processed. The where, so the way, the, the way it processes, it goes select something from aircrafts. So it says, okay, I'm going to go grab stuff from this table. Where, whatever the rules are, 
and then it does the aggregates after the where. It limits the rows and then does the math. So how can you limit on the results of the math if the math has not happened yet? So that's why you can't do the aggregate in the where because the, uh, the math of the aggregate happens after the rows have been selected. So imagine, um, back to my survey example, where any survey where they didn't answer all the questions is invalid. So imagine they made you collate the results of the survey without getting rid of the invalid surveys first. You'd have a lot of junk. It'd be extra work. So what you do is you go through the surveys first, find the invalid surveys, and count them. It's a bit like when people go to vote, right? Some people will spoil their ballot because they don't like their choices, so they will literally spoil their ballot. When they're counting ballots at the end, they separate all the bad ballots out first before they start counting the results of the election. They do keep track of the spoiled ballots, but they take them out first. So there is a way of doing this, um, which I'll address in a moment. The other thing you can't do is I'm going to take this off. You cannot put an aggregate on an aggregate. So here's, this sounds like a perfectly valid question, right? I want to know the aircraft manufacturers and what is the average number of aircrafts each manufacturer makes? It sounds like a valid question you'd ask, right? Or on average, how many different planes is, do manufacturers make? And we will run this for you so you can see what the error message is. It says aggregate functions cannot be nested because once it's done the aggregate, it doesn't go do it again. The aggregates get fired off once and only once. Cool. So those are the two things you cannot do with an aggregate. You cannot include the aggregate in the where clause, and you cannot nest an aggregate. So you can't aggregate an aggregate because it's already been processed. Okay. Now to take this out, and there's a few things we can do still. Let's just say, back to that whole thing about, I want to know aircraft manufacturers that make at least five planes. We have a special clause that's called having. And in here, we can literally go Count greater, the count is greater than five. So some people usually ask, well, what's the difference between having and the where? The where clause is used to reduce the number of rows. So now we're just going to be down to two rows with this example. Select star from aircrafts. Just run this bit here. I get 48 rows. If I look at how many aircrafts there are total, there's 343. So the reason why you do the where is to reduce the amount of rows being operated on. Back to my example of the surveys. You had 400 surveys, but only 36 are valid. Would you do all 400 surveys or would you just do the 36 that, that apply? Which one's going to be faster? Obviously, the 36. Same thing here. You do the where clause first, reduce how much is being operated on. And then, if you want to filter by the results of the aggregate, that's what the having clause is for. So, the way it all happens, it goes select something from aircrafts, limit it to the wake size of large. I want you to count the descriptions and you're going to group it by name. So this all works. Like this is a complete statement unto itself. And it gives me this result. So we have, these are all the aircraft manufacturers that have a wake size of large. The having kicks off after the aggregate is created. 
So it does the math. It creates the bins with the numbers in it. And then it looks for a having clause. The having clause will then filter based on the results of the math so that you don't have to do it in the application. Um, just ignoring the order by. But I mean, that's that's fine, you know. So this is how you filter on the results of the math. You filter before the math to reduce how much you're working on with the where clause. The having allows you to filter on the results of the math so that once the math is complete, you can limit how much is being returned. Um, and what's cool with this statement I have on the screen right now is it covers every topic from last week and this week in once in one query. So I just also did some review from last week at the same time. So you can see here where we're selecting, we have an alias, we have a where clause, we have our order by down here, and then we have our aggregate function and the aggregate specific stuff is here. Um, that is a bit of you know, literally the last two weeks in one statement. Um, that's literally all there is to aggregates. You can do multiple aggregates. You can sort by multiple results, which I did. Uh, you can rename them. You can filter by them. Um, some people will try to cheat. Um, and some database servers will let them cheat where they don't understand that they could actually go weak size equal to large. And they'll write this here. If you did this in MySQL, it'll go cool. No problem. I got gotcha. you. And it would work. It would give you the exact same result. Postgres says, nah, you're not allowed to do that because the wake size is not in the group by. So if I include wake size here, I run it, here's the exact same result. Now, the reason why this is stupid, because it is, is you're going to operate on all, and this is a small table, so really the performances make a difference. But you're going to operate on all 300 rows. Do the math. And by the way, you're going to break it down by two categories. So if I were to throw in the wake size here, just show you. It literally breaks it down by two categories. And then it filters it to size large. So you're making it operate on everything. Do all the extra math, all the extra collation and the binning and everything. And they say, by the way, I didn't want three quarters of that. So don't do this. It's just stupid. Just just putting it out there. Um, is it going to perform much slower? Uh, 87 milliseconds. This is actually probably going to be slower the first time. 119, 86, 71, 63. It is marginally faster once it's cached because the server caches the results, right? It is marginally faster. Not much faster. It will be a little bit faster. Now, if you were operating on a... It would be dramatically faster. The other cool thing is... Let me just run the explain on this for you guys. Okay. So this is a button you guys haven't played with yet. Well, you're never going to really play with it until you start doing this for a living. Um, Explain shows you what the database server is thinking of at each step. So what's happening here is it's doing a table scan right here. So it does a sequential scan because there's no indexes or anything like that. It does the math, and then when it's done, it does the sort. The aggregate also includes the having clause. The table scan is happening because the wake size is not indexed. So it has to read every row. So it's showing you what each step is doing. If with Next week, when we start doing significantly more complicated queries, you'll see that the explain gets really fancy. There's like branches and all kinds of logic. Um, but yeah, that covers everything about the aggregates you guys need for the lab. It covers um, all the aggregate stuff you need for the assignment. 
Um, next week, I'll cover the last bit you guys need for the assignment. Um, I'd cover it today, but I need to cover the other topic first so that the last piece is done. Otherwise, you'd have it taught to you like within like three days of the assignment being due. That's not cool. So I'd rather cover it today. Um, so let me just go through the slides really quick. Make sure I didn't forget anything. Okay. Count done. Okay. Group by having done. Oh, okay. Uh, there's this is a little point here. I always forget this. So I already explained how the where clause specifies which rows are going to be used to have the math. So reduce the pile. Um, the having clause reduces the results. Um, in general, always place the where before the group by. Uh, some database products don't care, but I've worked with Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, and DB2, and all of them cared. So I don't know where whoever wrote the slide saying that some don't care, because every major one I've ever used cares. So the the where always goes before the group by. And there's also ambiguity in the statement that include both where and having, because like I was saying, some people will use the where clause in the having, or they'll try to use the aggregate in the where clause, and it doesn't work. Um, what's going to happen is the SQL interpreter, the thing that reads the command before it runs it, will always execute the where first regardless. So it'll always do the where, then it does the having. That way, there's no ambiguity on how the math is being run. As long as you understand the order of process, your results will be consistent. Uh, group in my one, more than one column. I did that because I showed it to you by, you know, how the stupid wake size thing is. <clears throat> um, this is just a few different error messages. These error messages are actually from Microsoft SQL Server. So, you know, uh, they're similar to that. So what this is saying is um, the SKU is invalid because it's not included in the group by. That was the first error message I showed you guys where I, I added country ID and then it gave me an error because country ID wasn't in the group by because a good database server will not let you aggregate and display without creating the bins that the group by generates. Um, oh yeah, uh, I didn't mention that. You can order by if I want to, I can order by the alias, which is cool. Um, so if you don't want to order by the actual aggregate function, you can just use the alias. Cool. You know, it's nothing major. Um, but it, you can use the alias as you want. Um, yeah, this is saying, again, you need to have it in the column. This is talking about how you can't use the aggregate in the where clause. So I covered that. Um, this slide is dumb because it's missing a piece. Um, it's what this is saying is some database servers will uh, would allow you to go and it would actually run it but return nothing. Because you're aliasing something, it would return nothing. On the other hand, Postgres is a little smart and it goes, yeah, I can't do that because it hasn't been aggregated yet. So apparently Microsoft SQL Server lets you do it. And so does MySQL. Um, it is what it is. Okay, so there's just a few. Uh, these are an aggregate functions. These are string functions. Um, you guys have seen concatenation in your Java class. String A plus string B equals longer string. Does that ring a bell? Okay. Because I had a couple of people give me the look of fear that you should have seen this in your Java class. Because the other group said, yeah, yeah, they already covered that. So I'm like, oh. Yeah, so concatenation is when you take two strings and you glue them together. Database servers support concatenation. Some use a function, some use an operator. Postgres uses an operator, MySQL uses a function. Um, I will show you guys what that looks like. So if I go select 
name, comma, description from aircrafts. And I run this, I get two columns. But let's just say I actually wanted one column back. I could use the concatenate operator. So in Postgres, the concatenate operator is double pipe. Um, most keyboards, but I know there's a few international keyboard in, keyboards in here, it's usually between the backspace key and the enter key, the pipe. It You guys are really comfortable with that key on most English keyboards because it's the closing brace, the closing curly. So do shift closing curly and that'll give you a pipe. And if I run this, it returns it as a single column. Not that useful right now because it's gluing it together. So you can get a little fancy and start gluing a bunch of strings. So you can take a field, glue it to a string, glue it to a field. And now we have aircraft manufacturers and their airplanes as a single column. And I could rename this as planes. And now I've got a cool column with the nice names for the planes using concatenation. Um, that's handy. And this one talks about trim with concatenation. My, my database doesn't lend itself to that. Uh, but what I can do is demonstrate. This is a string with a bunch of white space. And I'm going to run this. Oh, no, not that. Well, actually, I would still work, but let's do this. So it's a string with a bunch of white space. The issue with this IDE is it actually does some trimming for you already. It's trimming the space off the start. So you guys, I think, probably have seen trim in Java. If not, um, it's a string function. So you know how you have a string variable that's actually a string object? And it's got methods you could call on it. And so those would include trim, length, uh, if it's anything like some of the other languages I've worked with, substrings, stuff like that. So trim I wish you would stop putting in my parentheses for me. Str trims the white space off. So instead of so if you are handling input from a database that's been less than well maintained. So somebody created a web app and they weren't cleaning the data before they put it in the database. Suddenly you got people hitting space bar at the end of their name. And now you've got usernames with spaces at the end and stuff like that. Trim will clean that up. Uh, there's trim. There's L trim, which is trim only the left side. We have R trim that only trims the right side. So, and the last useful function, which is not in the slides, is length. Well, that's cool. I got the exact same number as last class, and I just randomly put in spaces. Um, 56. So this string is 56 characters long. And just show you guys what the trim does. I could go trim, not no, not timmer. Trim. And now it's 43 because I, I trimmed off all the white space. So you can just see how what the trim's actually doing, because it trimmed off all of these and all of those. So those are just a couple of useful string functions. They decided to just throw them at the end of the aggregate slides for, I guess, shits and giggles. Um, you should really look at the Postgres documentation for some of these functions. There are some really useful functions in there for you guys to play with. Um, there's substring functions where you can search for the position of a string inside of another string. So you want to know whether AN is in a person's name. You can tell it to tell you the position of a n in a string. Um, so you can splice it, stuff like that. Um, there's ex there's uh, functions for exploding the strings where you give it a character and it breaks it into multiple pieces. 
um, all kinds of cool stuff like um, uppercase, lowercase, which I, you guys saw last week, right? I did lower. Those are string functions. Modify it uppercase, lowercase. Uh, there's one for uh, initial uppercase, so it'll actually take a lowercase string, make the first one. So it's like a name. So you can clean up names. As long as you don't have a Scottish last or an Irish last name, you're good. Um, because then, you know, the McIsaacs and the McNevins and the, you know, Macintoshes are going to get mangled. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it for these slides. Yes. All right. So this is aggregates. It's really not a complicated topic. The lab eight is actually fairly straightforward. It walks you through a bunch of different aggregates and how to use them. So whatever I showed you guys today, there's nothing in those labs I didn't do today in the last half hour. It's, you just got to figure out how to put it together, but that's the point of the labs. So now I'm going to dive into the first bit of week 13, which is views. So views are named query that's stored in the database. Um, my database prof from way back would be really, really upset with me using this example. Think of it like a bookmark in your web browser. You know, you can take a really long URL, then you make a bookmark. It has a nice little name, but it goes back to that big long URL. Same idea. So every time the view is called by its name, it runs the query. So it literally, all you're doing is storing the query in the database. It allows you a few things. It allows you to hide the base table, to only show a subset or a summary of the data of one or more of the base tables. Uh, complex queries that need to be executed frequently can be saved as a view for easier access. So that example I just did, I'll be showing you guys how it could be just be stored for future use. To create the view, and this cell says MySQL because I didn't update it but the syntax is the same. Create or replace view, give it a name, as, then a select statement. The or replace is optional, and it's used when a view may already exist. What it allows you to do is look if the view already exists. If it does, it replaces it so that you don't get an error of trying to create the same twice. I've had mixed bag results with the or replace because different database servers will behave slightly different on how they accept that or replace. Um, I think it's Postgres that has a problem with it. If the number of columns being returned in the in the query don't match what was there originally, the or replace will fail. Normally, I, I personally never use or replace. I drop the view and recreate it every time. Historically, that's worked better for me. So it's a little extra work, like one extra line of code. But I prefer to drop it than create and drop it instead of replacing it. Uh, the name of the view, well, that's the name of the view. And then the where condition is whatever you want it to be. Um, there's a simple example create view doctor as select name of hospital, comma doctor from hospital. And and this the slides are wrong. That should be select star from hospital. So you know what? I'll just do it. Okay. So let me bring back my complicated query there. I just had that that all in one example for you guys. Come on, we're almost there. No, like this. Okay. Let me make sure this works. Good. So I'm going to create a view. Create view. The v underscore is up. It, that's a that's a knee thing. It's not a standard. It's not a rule. I just tend to put a v in front of my views because I want to remember that they're views. Ah, uh, big planes. As, and I hit go. It says create view returns successfully. 
So now what's cool is I can go select star from V big planes. Planes. Run. Same result. Much shorter query. Here's the thing about a view. It looks like a table. It smells like a table. It's not a table. It's known as a derived table or a dyna or a um, logical table. So essentially what happens is it runs the query, takes the results, puts them in memory, and says, this is a table, it's called V big planes. Once the query is done running, it forgets a, that table in memory ever existed. It creates an in memory, temporary in memory table. And it names it V big planes because that's the name of the view. You can use this view with where clauses, where aircraft, why can I not type today? Aircraft count is equal to seven. And look at that. It looks just like a table. It behaves just like a table. It will respect indexes of except it's hiding the structure of the database from you. Uh, no, not that, this one. So there's an alter view command where you can alter the view. Um, it's the MySQL specific thing. Every other database server, you have to do create or replace. Um, maybe the other database server, the bigger database servers have it. I don't know. I've never used it anywhere else, but you can technically alter the view, which is the same thing as create or replace, but alter. So it gives you two ways of doing the same job. Um, here's an example of altering the view. Technically, it would work. You can drop a view by drop view, name of view, view goes away. Done. Okay. Now I'm going to stand up. Oh, pretty much done typing. So there's two kinds of views, dynamic views and materialized views. <laughs> Everything I've been talking about so far is a dynamic view. It, a dynamic view is also known as a virtual table or a logical table. Some people will call it a derived table. It's not. But some textbooks will refer to it as a derived table. And that means some profs will call it a derived table because that's what they learned. Ouch. Sorry. Um, so it's a virtual table logical view. The thing is it does not occupy space. Well, it occupies a little bit of space. It occupies the space of the, the text of the query plus the name of it. Literally in the database, there's a special structure. It says view name, here's the query. So it could occupy, I don't know, how many characters are in this view? If I go back to my creed view here. Uh, that's not very useful. It doesn't tell me how many characters it is. But if I come here where I've got it, it is 166 characters. So that means uh, 166 characters plus the name of the view. So it occupies almost no space. I mean, realistically, it's occupying 200 bytes. That's nothing, you know. I mean, an empty file on your disk takes up more than 200 bytes half the time by the time it's done being allocated. So it takes up no room. When invoked, the query is executed by the referring tables. In other words, it runs live and hot. And of course, complex query can be simplified. Any changes in the data will be reflected immediately. That's why it's known as a dynamic view, because it's always up to date. It's dynamically updated. It will always give you the most recent data. The issue is it also queries the database every time. If there's aggregates, it does the math every time. But it will be up to date. Um, <clears throat> I don't know why that dropping view thing is in there. So, which leads me to the other kind, materialized views. These are known as persistent views. When you create the view, it actually creates 
a table, let's say, it's more or less a table, in the database, and it takes the results of the query and actually stores them. The results will take up room because obviously if you're actually storing the results of the query, it's going to take up space on the disk. Um, and every time you query from that materialized view in the future, it will always use whatever was there in that view when it was created. So the second you create the materialized view, it is out of date. However, it has some really big perks. Number one, it doesn't need to run the queries again. That means it's fast. Um, two, it allows you to denormalize the database so you can actually run reports on sane data. So you can take really complex stuff and store it permanently. Um, normally materialized views are used in data warehousing. Uh, that data warehousing is when you take complex data and you simplify it for reporting so that managers can run, you know, Power BI or Cognos or insert report engine here against it and run reports from the database on that complex data that's been simplified by the materialized view. Um, they're really, really good for um, data that is stored long term. So you want to talk about sales over time, year over year, sales trends over the last five years. You'd store that in the materialized view. Instead of doing the math on, say, 10 years of data, it's already been done once. Therefore, it's almost instant. Um, normally, what happens is the data needs to be refreshed. And I'll show you guys that command in a moment. And you'd have a batch job that runs once a night, once a week, once a month and it refreshes the views to the latest version of the data. So if anybody in here has ever sold anything on eBay, or if anybody here has ever dealt with an Amazon store, not as buying stuff, but actually on the seller side of Amazon, you have a dashboard. And that dashboard has sales trends and stuff. Every time you look at your dashboard, it's not querying the entirety of Amazon's database. It's querying materialized views that already has your data summarized. So it'll query today's data, because that's going to be a small subset, small, Amazon, small. And everything else is being pulled from old data, because why query 10 years worth of data every time somebody refreshes the web page to see how good they're doing that day? You'd use the materialized view. So how do you create the materialized view? Instead of create view, you go create materialized view. There, done. You have materialized view. You have a persistent view that the data is stale, but will also no longer run the underlying query. That means it doesn't have any overhead. If you want to drop it, drop materialized view. You can't go drop view against materialized view unless you tell it drop the materialized view. Um, so there's just a few different, they, they decided to just go through a few ex different examples, but I just, uh, um, just going to explain what's going on here. So I run a dynamic, I run a materialized view and I run a dynamic view right at the same time and assume the database structure is not changing. Both of them will look identical at that point. I then insert a row into a table. The dynamic view will see the new row. The materialized view will not. Because it's the materialized view is stale. The second it's been run, and if it's not been refreshed, it's now out of date. So at that point now, the view, the data, and the materialized view are slowly diverging away from each other. So this is just saying, you know, if you were doing this, um, if you ran it, you'd see differences. So the biggest problem with materialized view is. The data is stale. It needs to be refreshed. It's always going to be inconsistent with what's live. So how do you refresh it? Refresh materialized view, you give it the name. So what happens at this point is the database server reaches into its innards, 
goes and looks at what the original query was that created the materialized view, runcates the view, and then repopulates it at that moment. And this happens like that. Mind you, if the query takes 30 seconds to run, it's going to take 30 seconds to populate. But that whole, you know, let's clean up the mess and figure out what we're supposed to do again and refresh. It's one command. And the length of time is just how long does it take to actually run the query. Um, so this is where I'm going to put in a, a small aside. MySQL, which you played with the first last semester, does not have materialized views because it fell off the short bus and they decided they didn't need that feature. They said, you can emulate materialized views by you create a table, you run a command to insert the data into the table based on the query. Sounds like a materialized view. And now it's got the data. When you want to refresh it, you runcate the table and rerun the insert. The problem is that you're running three or four commands to do the same thing of refresh materialized view. The other thing about refresh materialized view is it marks the starting point of when you ask for that command so that anything that has been added to the database after you've issued the command is not going to be included. If you're doing the MySQL way, you truncate your materialized your table and then you insert all the stuff. From the time you started to the time you finished, several seconds of gap because humans aren't that fast. You, your database may not be quite in the state that you want it to be. You probably never notice, but it's not the same. One is a single command that happens as a single block of work. The other one is multiple commands. And they each take time. And you may end up with some, you know, timing inconsistencies. Not real inconsistencies, but timing inconsistencies. Let's just say you're you're supposed to refresh it at midnight every night. Refresh materialized view. Bam. Midnight. The other one, you have some script that's running on the server as a time job. And it fires off each of those commands one after another. By the time it's done, it might be 1201. You might have one minute of extra data in there that you didn't need. Realistically, would it ever make a difference? No. But it's not the point. If you're in an environment where it is important to be dead on accurate, it's not going to be. Because you can't guarantee it will be. Um, this is just showing examples about deleting the row and how they don't update each other. Um, okay, so the last one I'm going to talk about is updating views. Not updating the structure of the view, it's creating something called updatable views. Updatable views means it's a view where you can add, update, and delete data from the underlying tables. It's a pain to do. It almost defeats the purpose of the view because you must include every key column so all the primary keys have to be included in the view any field that is not null must be included in the view <clears throat> at that point you're probably pulling back half if not more of the table you can't use an aggregate you can't use functions why not just pull the data straight from the table at that point? Um, there is a small purpose for this, and I'm, you know, I'm being a bit facetious. I'm saying like, it's, this is pointless. There is a small purpose. Uh, it would be in environments where there's sensitive data. So you have a large group of people accessing a database, and there's certain pieces of data in this database that not everybody's allowed to see. So the application is written so that by default. Everybody gets the view without all the extra fields. Extra fields can be things like SIN numbers or credit card numbers or passport numbers or things that can be, you know, bad if it got out in the wild. Um, the view, you could use the view to hide those columns and still have the whole thing be updatable. So, you know, you got the receptionist that goes, oh, they called and said their, ad, their email address changed. Okay, so pop, 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 they update the email address. She doesn't need to know the person's SIN number. They don't need to know the person's credit card information or their checking account or whatever. So creating an updatable view for that makes sense. 
because then you could have the view that excludes all the sensitive fields, but have everything else. But realistically, most purposes people use views for is to also simplify complex queries that come from multiple tables. And if you have multiple tables involved, which I'll be showing you guys how to do that next week, that means you need to include the primary keys from all the tables, all the not null columns from every table, all the foreign keys from all the tables. It gets complicated and it's really, unless you have a really good reason, there's no good reason to do it. Um, also, we don't talk about security, but the user has to have access to those tables. So often when people are creating complex database systems, different employees will have different user IDs that connect to the database that actually passes the user. Oracle is a good example of this. When you log into an Oracle-based application, it takes your username and it connects using your login to the database server, and it uses that to authenticate what you're allowed to touch. If you don't have access to the underlying tables, the views will not work. If they're updatable. If they're just like regular views, then the permissions will let them look at the data, but they won't be able to do updatable views. So that means the user technically can read and write all the data outside of the view without the view. Again, we're back to the whole why use a view in that situation. Just write your application better. Um, and that was just talking about that. Okay, so I'm not talking about indexes. So now with all that said, um, and I did lose the first five minutes of the lecture audio wise. Great. Good job, Dan. I'm saving, I'm trying to save all my batteries. Um, you now have everything for part one, part two, and part four of the assignment. You have three quarters of what you need for part three of the assignment. Like after the first hour next week, you will have everything you need for the assignment. I am trying to get that covered as fast as I can. If next week goes well, the first half goes well, I may cover the rest of week 13 and you guys may actually have a free lecture. Uh, we I don't know if that's going to happen, but we'll see how next week goes. You may end up with an empty lecture, which is not the end of the world. I'm sure many people in here would appreciate being able to just go home and sleep or do their homework. Um, may, I make no promises. Putting that, putting that out now, no promises, but I'm going to try. Uh, outside of that, that's it, folks. I will uh, see you in lab or see you next week.